I'm not sure if you guys are like me, but in retrospect, through all my schooling, all the way from elementary to graduate school, you don't really realize the cost of not paying attention in your daydream until, well, that moment when the professor or the teacher or your boss asks you a question, right? Asks you a question and you're like fooling around with your classmates or you're daydreaming. How many people do that? <laughs> you, you daydream and so you're not there, you're somewhere else and every, you know, you're having a great time until the moment of truth. And let me tell you, speaking as a professor, when I taught, I knew students, and you think that professors don't know, you're on your laptop, you're like, laughing <laughs> 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 every five seconds, you're on aim, like people don't know, or you think you're so smart that you're getting away with it and you have the subplot in the classroom. You know, I know, and, and just to make a fool out of those punks, I would pick on them, I would pick on them intentionally, I'd be like, so, what do you think about that, Curtis? You know? And you know, and then the person would be like, and of course all, I mean, everyone been in, been in this situation before, what do you unanimously slay all the delinquents in the room? What was the question? Everybody is looking for an answer, but when you're doing your own thing, you're what? Still, at, you're still trying to figure out the question, right? Now, this type of independence seems in the surface like rudeness, right? You're teaching a class, you're talking to someone, and they're off doing their own thing. But it's not really rudeness. It's arrogance. Why are you doing independently when everybody in community is learning or doing something together? Why are you independent? Well, it's not because you're rude. You know, you know, you don't try to be rude. It might appear that way. It's arrogance. You think you're smart enough to control the pace of what you learn and how you learn. You're not really what? Following. You're what? You're leading. Look at look at the person to your left and right. Look at them well. Let me tell you, there's a rebel. There's a punk, little punk, in all of us. <coughs> and, and the thing is, it's not total independence. Call someone, you're a punk. And you're like, oh, that's rude. But, but you, know, you know there's that, that rebel in you, that, the little bit of you that, that, that's a punk. Because you think, you're not, it's not, you're saying that I'm the smartest person. I'm just a little bit smarter than him or her. I'm just a little better. Or this professor, oh, I could learn it in the textbook. And so you euphemize what you're doing. What you're really doing is leading the classroom in your own world. You're, you're doing your own thing because you're a punk. And that's why you're independent. And this applies to our life with God. Spiritually, it doesn't matter you know, what, what, whatever your issue is, that little bit of independence that we want. We want that from God too. And here's where the conflict comes in. The Bible says very clearly, Jesus says, look, listen, the disciples were punk, little punks. I mean, if you read the New Testament, they're, they're, I mean, Captain Punks. I mean, really, they're, they're the leaders of all punks. I mean, literally, you know, they're always doing their own thing. Jesus is like, come on, pay attention. And they're like, huh, what was the question? Jesus says to them, he goes, okay, listen, let me be frank. You can do nothing apart from me. And then, you know, I, when I read that passage in John 15, I was like, well, there's a lot of things I can do apart from God. I can think of a lot of creative things, too. <laughs> And, and, and here's the thing, if you keep, what, doing and doing and doing, what do you get? Do-do. If you want to you, you analyze your life, where, where you might be in your life, all you need to do is look at your life every single time you do-do-do. 
in independence because you think you're a little smarter. You think you got it. You're smarter than the government, or you think you're smarter than God, or you think you're smart. You always find yourself in doo doo. You always find yourself in a mess. And what, 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 what God is trying to help us understand in the gospel is that the gospel is never about, you'll never come to a place in life, or just in, in, in general in the universe, you'll never come up, up to a place where you're totally independent. That's impossible. The gospel is about a relationship, a dependent one, a one where you work together. But no, a lot of times the problem of independence and why we want to be independent from God, even though we're in the classroom of learning from him, is because we, are, we disagree with his pace. I can learn faster. I can achieve this thing faster if I just did it this way. God, why do you want me to do it this way? Wait, how many years? Uh-uh. Look, I have, the, I, have my pl I have it planned out. This is the math. This is the projection. And of course, you read through history over and over again, everyone that wants to be independent, I think they're really smart, finds himself in a mess. So the question I want to unpack as we go back in Exodus 23 is the question, where is Jesus in our want for independence? That little punk in us. Well, let's look here and let's tackle this. So I want you to read the first Two words with me. Verse 21 says? Pay attention. Okay, so tell someone, pay attention to this. Pay attention. Pay attention. Okay, pay attention, okay? It says, first thing, if, if God knows his people, it's one thing. He says, okay, listen. Pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Okay, read, this, read the next three words with me. Do not... Okay, so the first thing he says is, pay attention. The second thing he says is, do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion. So he uses the word rebel and rebellion twice and pay attention for the first time. Now, if you're reading this, I mean, who do you think God is talking to? They must be certain type of people. Like God it goes, okay, make sure you pay attention. Don't rebel he will not forgive your rebellion. And he goes, since my name is in him. He goes, if you listen carefully. That's just like saying pay attention again. Do what he says and do all that I say. And I will be an enemy to your enemies and will oppose those who oppose you. Now, here's the context if you're joining us for Exodus 23. God has promised his people, the Israelites, which are the Jews, I will take you into the promised land. They've left Egypt. God's delivered them with a mighty hand. So it's pretty imperative. When God says here, I'm going to send an angel before you. I'm going to send my army before you. And you need to listen to him. So I think you have to be pretty level-headed to understand that you're going into war. Well, you know what happens? You ever watch movies with people in war and they don't pay attention? They're dead. <laughs> and um, so you come here, you go, well, why is God so concerned, so patient, actually, with these group of people? And he says, well, pay attention, listen carefully, don't rebel. You know, don't rebel. Because God knows the type of people he's dealing with. I remember, this is why I stopped teaching college level courses because they're all little punks. Honestly, to tell you. I remember a student of mine, I'm not gonna mention his name even though I already did. <laughs> uh, he was one of those types that thought he was smart but you know he wasn't. And he had this sense of, um, I don't know, thinking that he was, he, he got it. He, he got an epiphany from God that he's that he supposed to preach the gospel. And 
you know, when he, the first time he came to class and he gave a presentation, I was just like, wow. I was amazed, not by his skill. <laughs> just amazed by how, you know, bad his communication was. It was terrible. I mean, this guy, you know what they say about communication, right? Communication is 95% nonverbal. You can be really smart, you know, and I, I'm sure when you guys all went to school, there are a lot of smart guys with PhDs, you're just like, what? You, you just don't want to listen because it doesn't make sense. And this guy, his personality was exciting as a block of, of wood. No, no, can't. wood is maybe too organic, <laughs> you know, just a block of cement. That's how exciting he was. When you looked at him, you're just like, there's nothing interesting about this guy. And on top of that, he was angry. He was always predicting doom for the church and for people. And he was saying, you, you people in this classroom, including the professor, need to repent. <laughs> if you want to get a good grade, you don't do that. <laughs> That's just not smart. So obviously he wasn't smart. So he was communicating these things, and he was very condescending. So what I said to one of him was, I said, listen, man. Okay, I need you. One time I just cut him off. Said, Sit down. We're going to have an intervention. We're going to pray for you. We've never done this in class before, but you're going to need this. You're going to need this if you ever want to do this. For a he's, he's all angry. He goes, okay, all right, listen. We're going to pray for you. He goes, okay. I don't want you to do anything I say in this class. He was like, oh, great, you know. He goes, you don't need to do any of the assignments. For the next three times you communicate, you're going to do a comedy routine. He was like, What? Because if you want to pass this class, you're going to write a five-minute minute comedy piece. Because this is what I was, I was afraid that this guy, he would go into wherever and people would want to kill him. You know, because there was no way you could connect with this guy because he was too self-righteous. So he came in class and <laughs> he started juggling. <laughs> you know, he goes, he goes, he goes, I can be funny too. Watch, I'm going to juggle one thing. <laughs> I'm gonna juggle two things, and then he I got up to you know three, and then he started he, then he started throwing the fruit at us, <laughs> and then he said this is this is exactly the problem with the church. It's all entertainment. Oh my gosh. He didn't get the point. You failed. You failed the class. <laughs> what do you get from this? Where is Jesus in our need for independence? Well, the first thing we learn from this passage is what? He sees the what? Listen, you, you, go to, you look at my student there and you're like, oh, he's such an idiot. God is doing this in our life all the time. He's trying to lead us. He's trying to speak to us. He's trying to guide us. He sees things in us. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe he sees things in us that maybe in our intelligence and we're so gifted, but you can't see. And he's trying to communicate this to us in the classroom. We're just like, nah, I don't think so. I don't see it. If Therefore, if I do not see it, it does not exist. It's called denial. And it's not like we don't want to be in relationship with God. It's just that even though we are, we don't agree with his pace in our life. And so this punk in us says, well, I think, I think if I did this, it'll be fine. But God sees that and says, no. Try, try to get what I'm telling you. It's an attitude issue. And it's in all of us. Anyone with this attitude cannot what? Receive or learn. But it's in all of us, it is. Because we think we've lived life, because we think we're smart, because that's when you're in trouble. And honestly, in your life right now, what is God trying to tell you? Or you're just being a little punk. And you go, you know, no, other people are, no, you're a punk. So am I. It's in us. The stubbornness is there. And that's what God is dealing with here in this passage. 
So look into your life. I pray that God would show you right now in the areas of your life where you're just being a little punk. And you're just like, no, no. I don't want to do that. And you forget. You forget that the whole point, that this is a relationship, that God is a father. We've been seeing this in the motif of Exodus, that God is a father that loves us. That he wants us to take us to the places that he has promised us. But he will not do it in the expense of ruining us. So I look today in this passage and go, and a lot of people say this a lot when they read the Old Testament, those people are so stupid. And I go, have you looked into your life lately? <laughs> I look, I go, that's me. Yeah. God is dealing with that. And that's why we need grace, <laughs> right? So let's go, let's go down here. So he sees the little punk in all of us. Now, if you listen carefully to what he says and do all that, what? I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies, and I will oppose those who oppose you. Remember, they're going to war. You know, one of the things I'm afraid of, because my son, he's four, my son thinks he's the greatest, greatest thing in the world. He has a problem with narcissism. I'm serious, he does. He has this problem where he thinks he's great because he is great. I mean, if there's any little punk in the world, he's a little punk. And I call my son, like, you're a little punk. He's like, okay. And he just smiles. I'm afraid that he's gonna be a little, he's gonna be this little punk to bigger punks when he goes to school, you know? And, and a lot of people, and, you know, one of it, you know, one of our closest guys in our church says, Nathan, you're going to get into a lot of fights. <laughs> you're going to get into a lot of fights. And Nathan's like, I'm going to get into mad fights. And, and I'm just like, no, no, no. But sometimes when you're affirmed over and over again, see, here's why there's a subplot and we re resist what God is doing in our life or telling us to do because our subplot, whatever we're using to get what we want, seem to be working. That's why we don't want to listen to God, because we're not in failure yet. Let me quote, yet. Right? So, Israel, they just defeated the most powerful nation in the world, and they had nothing to do with it. But when you begin to win in your subplot, as a small nation, just historically speaking, when you're a small nation, a nomadic tribe, no one, nobody, and you begin to start winning, and you begin to start gaining land progressively, incrementally, you begin to develop a subplot rather than the glory of God. Rather than saying, God did this. You want to be able to say, maybe it was God, but it was some of me. But what you're saying, it was not really God, it was all me. And here you see the people of God develop a subplot in their life. Their thirst for glory. Anyone, anyone struggle with that? Their thirst for their own establishment and identity. And they begin, and this is what God says, don't forget, listen, pay attention. I will oppose your enemies. But what is the inverse of the condition? Because grammatically, this is a conditional promise. Because if you carefully listen and obey. Then I will oppose your enemies and those who oppose you. Sometimes, read verse right here. It says, I will be an enemy to your enemies and will oppose those who oppose you. My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land, right? And then, the last verse of 23, and I will what? Read, read, read this with me. And I will? That's a good thing. When you win this way, when you wipe out people, that feels good. And you're like, yeah, you know? We won, just like the Lakers are being wiped out <laughs> in Jesus' name. <laughs> They're being wiped out. Kobe Bryant been a bad boy. I'm kidding. I have no, I do have a personal, I'm, I mean, okay. I repent of that. Now, being wiped out, but sometimes in your victory, in your arrogance, Sometimes the best way to get a reality check to, and check your attitude is for you to be wiped out. I, I see this with my son. When, when his cousins came to visit us to go to Disney World, all of a sudden, his handsome, sexy charm, 
his little cute butt, <laughs> his dimples, his hair, where he just moves his hair all the time. No one told him to do that. He's like, I have beautiful hair. <laughs> you know, and, and the cousins did not care. We're from the same bloodline, buddy. Everybody's like, oh, you're so cute, you're so cute. And you develop a subplot as a boy because people love you, praise you, just because you're awesome. And then their cousins come, and he starts crying in the car for attention. And then, first, my niece says, shut up. <laughs> it's the first time in my life where my, someone told my son to shut up. And I was just like, what the heck just happened? And Nathan cry, started crying, and for the first time in his life, he just stopped crying because he was in shock. <laughs> and he has big eyes. It was really big. And he just went... <laughs> I'm traumatized. Someone told me shut up. And then my nephew said, will you shut up? And me and my wife were there in the car. <laughs> we were like, would we let anyone else do this? And, uh, you know, we wanted to do something, but then we realized that this is good for him. To realize that you are not in the center of the universe, buddy. These, these are your cousins. They're meant to torment you. <laughs> They're from your bloodline. They're meant to remind you that you're just human. That you're not in the center of the universe. And sometimes God does that. He lets you fall in your behind. To, let, to remind you, you're not in the center of the universe, buddy. I'm working in your life. I'm inviting you to this adventure, to the places I promised you, the dream I have for your life, but it's not about you. And you see, when you're off doing your own thing and your own subplot and caught in the affirmation of your gifts and it seems to be working, it's just a matter of time before you fall on your behind. And that's why God is addressing that little punk in us. He wants us to get there, and you go, what's there? You know what it is. God knows what it is. It's his dream for you. It's actually your dream. But how is the question. Who is the question? Who you become in the process. So where is Jesus in our independence? Well, lastly, he wants to save us from what? <laughs> from punking ourselves. You get the pun in that? Punking, see, the, the, here's the thing. You think you're smart because you see something that works apart from God. God looks at that. He goes, you're just punking yourself. So you're going to get punked up. You're going to ruin your life. You're going to get in this little subplot and you're going to fall in your behind. And sometimes it's a good thing. And if that's, happen, if that's happening to you, good. It'll remind us that the gospel is not about making us successful apart from him. It's not about making you awesome. It's about making him awesome in your life, through your life. That's what the gospel is. It's about saving us from our own arrogance, from our own weakness, from our own lust for whatever it might be, whatever subplot we have. Because God, in the motif of Exodus, is a father. My stomach is growling because I haven't eaten breakfast yet. <laughs> so we're going to pray real soon. <laughs> so whatever you need to do in your life right now to fix it up, we need to do it quick. <laughs> I need to go eat soon. But, okay, but, but here it is. Let me, I'm, okay, pay attention. I'm going to try to pay attention now. I was like preaching and went, <laughs> I, was like, I was like, chill, buddy. You're going to get something later. But, um, so, so I'm going to come back here. Look, look, I pray that the Spirit of God will show you right now in your life the areas of self-sabotage, the area of self-delay, self-destruction. Because you see that it's not circumstantial, it's an attitude, an attitude check. It's in the soul that says, I think I can get away with this. I think I can make this work. I think I got it. I know how to build my life my way. That part of us needs to be saved today. 
let God come in and deal with that little punk in us. So what? So that we can go back into the symphony that God's writing for our life. Because if last week was about impatience, about trying to get there faster, this week is really about what? It's about looking in and checking our attitude. Because you might want your own solo. You might think that in, you know, if you've ever been into an you know, orchestra or a band, there are people, I mean, anyone that plays instruments are annoying people. I mean, because you don't play an instrument because you like the instrument. You're like, oh, I, it sounds good. No, you want, it's about you. You know? And, and I remember when I was in a band, the drummer has massive problems. I mean, not this drummer. I mean, he does too. But I mean, you know, <laughs> drummers, the bass, drummers, electric guitar, piano players, and I mean, and, and the whole orchestra section. I mean, but these guys, they have identity problems. I mean, always, someone wants to, you know, the drummer, the drum, the drum guy in our band said, you, people cannot hear me. I need to play a little bit louder. Well, you're drowning the bass, you're drowning the piano. They're like, listen, I'm awesome. People, I need a solo. Well, you can't have a solo every single time. Well, I need a solo. Uh, because he, made, he makes it about him. It doesn't matter how much God orchestrates your life to be beautiful if you don't cooperate. You go, well, it has to be about me. Well, God goes, it's not about you. It's about the symphony. It's about the music that we make together. It's about the purpose I have for your life. And you're part of it, but you're not all of it. And we don't like that. That's the part of us that need to be killed today. Because no matter how beautiful something can sound, no matter how beautiful our life can be, if we don't cooperate, it never will be. Let God save you from that today. And dream of a life that God could bless. And we'll continue on with Exodus 23 next week, because it's pretty hungry now. <laughs> Stand pray together. Will you lift your hands with me to the Lord? Father, we come before you this morning. We want to surrender the little punk in all of us. Because the little punk in us will end up punking us. It adds no value to the purpose and destiny you have for our life, and it does not add value in us. And it, it amazes me, Jesus, that when you died on the cross, that what you were dying for was not necessarily just the external behaviors of history of all the sins culminated in history. What you were dying for on the cross was the hope for transformation of the soul. That part of us that is heavily narcissistic, me-centered, and wants to play just to my own tune. And even though we might think it sounds beautiful, it does not cooperate with the symphony of God. It does not cooperate with the conductor. And sometimes you look at us but you're patient. Today, I want to pray that we would cooperate. We would surrender our lives into your hands and begin to follow the conductor. Begin to follow the conductor's hands and move in one emotion with him. And I pray, God, as we begin to follow you, we would begin to hear the music that you are writing for our life.
hands right now and tell God as a symbol, God, I surrender. I surrender to your hands. I surrender my instruments into your hands, all the gifts you've given me into your hands. I will not use the instrument and the gifts you give in my life to write my own subplot for my own glory. Though that might be tempting, pray right now as we close today that you would surrender your life. We would surrender our gifts. We would surrender our talents and allow God to write the great symphony he has written for our life. And when we're ready, he will call you sometimes to be part of the orchestra. Sometimes to be the center of the orchestra. And I pray that we would trust the master conductor of our life to control the pace, that we would follow his pace. For he is trying to write great, beautiful music for our life and for others in our life. follow you. We surrender to you. Please deal with the little punk in us so we can join the orchestra that you are writing and you are using to write great music for the world. In your son, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You be seated. We want to welcome all of you today. We love that you joined us. Um, I want to make an announcement for Park Day. I think it's going to be in Memorial Day weekend. Just remember, we're not going to be here in the theater, and we're not going to have a, a service in the gym at all. We're going to invite all the families. Yes, even the annoying ones. All, the, all your friends, yes, especially the annoying ones. Everyone that you know to come out and it's going to be a potluck which means you can't be selfish and eat everybody else's food you got to bring your food to share and don't bring like cups <laughs> well someone someone please do but <laughs> we'll be sharing cups but you know what i mean um, park day is a vision to show people what the family of god looks like it's you know sometimes services is very content driven and you know sometimes we forget that the whole point of of these gatherings is a celebration of, of people joining the family of God. And uh, we want to make that special memorial day. So put that in your calendar, begin to invite friends and family, and especially, you know, if your mom cooks really well, invite her. <laughs> Today's Mother's Day, I give you permission. Okay? All right. Um, secondly, uh, we have small groups throughout you know, all our, you know, sites, whoever invited you here, you can, you can check more. You can, if you're new, you can write an info booth, um, info card, and we'll send you the sermons on a weekly basis, so you can check that out. And we don't collect offering in our services. Uh, we believe that anyone that wants to hear about the gospel, it should be free for them, absolutely free. The people that are our members and part of our family, we thank you for giving online, usually, at morningchurch.tv. You can give there, or you can give in the info booth, there's envelopes there. So let's pray, and we'll have a great weather Sunday. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this gathering today. We thank you that people are being invited to join the family of God. People are on the verge of joining in the family of God. But we thank you, God, that you are the great conductor of our life, and we trust you. We thank you for the gifts you've given us. We thank you for the talents you've given us, the instruments of life. We pray that we would cooperate with you and follow your lead so we can write great music and hear beautiful music to the world and they can find out who you are. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you soon.